Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second day of the Human Cell Atlas Latin America Symposium 2022. Uh, together with Yesid Cuesta from Colombia, we'll be moderating this morning session. Um, let me just share my screen here very fast. Can you see my screen, Yesid? Yes. Thank you. Uh, well, this is an event we are planning to have every two years. Um, the first version was in 2020, it was a success. success. Uh, this meeting is bringing together Latin American scientists currently exploring single cell sequencing technologies for broad discussions on applications and bottlenecks to benefit and improve human health. The students and postdoctorate fellows are also having the opportunity to present their work in the afternoon session. And our goal with e is to integrate biologists, computational biologists, and clinicians from Latin America interested in supporting this effort. Um, I would like to thank the organizing committee and the administration support, the team from the Human Cell Atlas, uh, Christine, Tracy, John, and Samantha, also the organizing committee from Latin America, Enrique Hernandez from Mexico, Patricia Severino from Brazil, and Yesi Cuesta from Colombia, and also the very important uh, support from Elena, Juliet, Laura, and Romario, who are working hard behind the scenes to make the, everything happen. <clears throat> and also, I would like to thank the, to mention the important support from two CCI-funded initiatives, uh, the Latin Cells and the Project Jaguar initiatives, uh, projects from people from Latin America, who are uh, generating data sets for the human cell atlas. And this meeting uh, is putting together uh, with uh, more people from more than 35 countries, with most of them from Latin America. And uh, yesterday we had in the morning five very interesting talks from Parta Mukanda from India, Andres Moreno, Mariana Boroni, and Leonardo Colado and Elden Nakaya in the morning section. And in the afternoon, we had uh, the lightning talks from postdocs and PhD students and a very nice breakout session in which people were discussing together all the bottlenecks and challenges behind uh, single cell, implementing single cell uh, research in Latin America. And today we will start with, uh, in this morning with Elizabeth Nero, then we have a talk by Maria Gutierrez, and then by Claudia Chica. All these talks will be moderated by Yesid Costa. Then we move forward to Marcela Solberg and Pablo Garcia. And at the afternoon, we'll have again some really nice four uh, lightning talks, and we'll finish it with the breakout sessions. It's important to be there at the breakout session because this is the great moment to have everybody together and start to build. Uh, community local here in Latin America. Uh, I'd like to invite you guys to join us at the Slack channel from the Human Cell Atlas and also to write us an email if you want to be part of this uh, Latin America network, Latin America community uh, dedicated to the Human Cell Atlas. You can write us an email and we will then uh, <clears throat> implement some, some specific groups to be discussing important things related to single cell. It's important to mention that this, uh, a part of this event that we have, we are having every two years, we also have a workshop, a practical workshop. The first version of that workshop was devoted to single cell RNA seq data analysis it was last year. And we will have an in-person version in next year between September, October of 2023. And we are still deciding the place that we'll have that event. So set the date for this period between September and October that we have this great event. Now, finally, if you would like to watch the meeting in Spanish, you may do so by clicking the interpretation button at the bottom of the screen and then select the ES for Spanish. The plenary sessions of the meeting are being recorded and will be posted in, on the event website, as well as the Human Cell Atlas YouTube and Bleedly sites after the meeting. Breakout sessions will not be recorded. To ask a question, please type into the chat box, bot, uh, in, box in the Zoom 
You can ask a question in English, Spanish, or even in Portuguese. And the moderators will be there to, to, to best address all the questions. Thank you very much. Welcome to this great event. I would like also to invite you to join the Human Cell Atlas community. And now I would like to invite Yassid Cuesta to introduce and moderate the next section. So thank you, uh, Vinicius, for this introduction. So uh, we are going to start with our first speaker of this uh, morning session. It's my, my pleasure to introduce uh, Elisabetta. Elisabetta Mereu is a computational biologist and the leader of the Cellular Systems Genomics Group at the Josep Carreras Leukemia Research Institute of Barcelona since 2021. Her research focus is to define the special temporal organization of complex tissues in health and diseases, particularly in the study of inflammation as a key driver of any chronic uh, disease. She's an active member of the Human Cell Atlas Consortium, where she leads the data analysis for the generation of the first Human Cell Atlas of the pancreas. Uh, furthermore, as part of the Standard and Technology Working Group of the HCA, she led the largest benchmarking of single cell RNA-seq protocols. And more recently, she is working on the development of a new framework to compare and integrate single cell multimodal data, including single cell RNA-seq, single cell ATAC-seq, and special transcriptomic uh, methods. So thank you, Elisabetta, uh, for joining us. And the floor is yours. Thanks. Hello. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, OK, let me uh, share my screen. I'm very excited to be here. Um, Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Oops. Yeah, no, it's okay. So, okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, so first of all, thanks a lot, uh, the organizers, for uh, inviting me to this uh, uh, nice event. A nice human cell atlas meeting that uh, gathered the whole Latin America community. Um, so I, I'm very excited to be here and speak about uh, uh, the work uh, in the lab. Uh, part of the of this work uh, started when I was a postdoc, uh, but still uh, I'm working on those uh, on some of these projects uh, as a group leader. So um, today I'm gonna talk about uh, the work uh, in the Human Pancreas Atlas. Uh, but first of all, I want to um, I want to um, uh, to give you a short introduction about what we do in the lab. So uh, in our lab, we are uh, interested in the characterization of uh, complex tissues at molecular and cellular level. To uh, in line with the Human Cell Atlas project, which aims to catalog all the types of cells in our body, we are uh, interested. Um, so we apply uh, single cell technologies as well as uh, special transcriptomics in order to obtain molecular and spatial reference maps of the normal tissues. Even that uh, uh, single cell technologies are uh, still new and uh, in continuous uh, evolution, technology benchmarking uh, in this sense uh, is very important. And therefore, uh, we compare several technologies and protocols in order to make sure that uh, the data that we generate are uh, genuine and also uh, the results that we have uh, are biological and not uh, uh, driven by technical uh, artifacts. This type of uh, characterization uh, of the complex tissues uh, become really important when uh, uh, cells are affected by perturbations. And uh, in this sense, we focus on uh, uh, natural perturbations such as aging and uh, other uh, uh, human disorders. Uh, including cancers, but uh, particularly we focus on inflammation, 
uh, as a very key driver of many uh, human disorders. Uh, therefore, we are interested in the characterization of uh, uh, inflammatory states that uh, often recur in uh, human diseases. So, but let's start with the, uh, the work that I will explain today, that is uh, about the human pancreas atlas. I will try to explain you why it is important and the impact that uh, our work can have, not only in uh, fundamental biology, but also in, um, at clinical level. So first of all, uh, just uh, a brief uh, explanation about uh, some concept uh, behind the, this organ. So first of all, the pancreas is a vital organ um, that consists of two main compartments, uh, the exocrine cells uh, that represent the majority of the pancreatic cells, 95%, and then uh, the endocrine compartment, 5% of the cells. These, um, these uh, two groups of cells uh, are representative of the dual function of this organ. Uh, in fact, the organ um, is uh, a key regulator of the secretion of the enzymes that are important for the digestive system but also for the regulation of several hormones, including, uh, uh, for example, uh, insulin. So any type of uh, dysfunction or dysregulation of this uh, activity can lead to uh, pancreatic disorders. And actually, there are many uh, human diseases that are associated with the pancreas, including uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, uh, which is one of the most aggressive uh, cancers, and uh, diabetes mellitus, which is uh, a high prevalent uh, disorders, metabolic disorders, uh, that is characterized by uh, high levels of, uh, of sugar in the blood. So despite uh, its uh, physiological imp importance, uh, the, a complete understanding of, of the pancreas remains uh, elusive. And uh, uh, one uh, of the challenges in studying the pancreas is the fact that, that uh, due to its uh, high autolytic activity, um, it, the, there is a, a rapid degradation of the cells uh, as well as their uh, RNA uh, following the pancreatic resection. Therefore, to improve uh, our knowledge of the pancreas, um, the ESPAS consortium uh, joined uh, at the beginning of 2020 in order to, um, to advance uh, um, uh, the, the knowledge uh, to advance the knowledge about about this organ. So the consortium includes uh, uh, several teams uh, that with different expertises. Uh, actually, a multidisciplinary groups that include experts in uh, pancreatic uh, sample procurement, uh, but also a data scientist, uh, expert in bioinformatics analysis, uh, in genomic analysis, uh, and uh, I see as uh, IT uh, experts uh, to help us with the um, uh, sharing of this a huge amount of data and uh, and uh, iCloud platform uh, and uh, all that is necessary to build uh, a, a huge resource uh, uh, such as the one that we are uh, generating. So uh, the main goal of uh, this consortium is uh, to, which is called ESPAS, is to, uh, to have a comprehensive molecular characterization of the human pancreas. And uh, to do so, we have uh, collected uh, three different cords, uh, which are uh, the um, which include uh, fetal samples from four to thirteen uh, uh, weeks uh, uh, post conception, uh, the adult cord uh, with the main focus uh, on exocrine cells, and then uh, disease samples, uh, uh, a cord that uh, actually include uh, samples obtained from uh, patients, uh, type two diabetes patients, but also controlled to make a proper comparison. 
So with these uh, samples, we have generated uh, particularly transcriptomics, uh, to, particularly today uh, we focus on the transcriptomics and chromatin uh, accessibility profiling of, uh, of these uh, cells uh, in order to have uh, a, a full com complete characterization of uh, the different cell types of the pancreas. But also we, we are interested in the reconstruction of cell type development. And also we will see, um, uh, we will obtain a micropathology characterization. And later I will explain you better uh, the meaning of this. Uh, so we will check some of the common uh, histopathological features and we will try to have a complete molecular characterization of those. Uh, so uh, we include uh, single nuclei RNA-seq, ATAC-seq, uh, VASA-seq, another protocol for uh, transcriptomics profile. Uh, and also uh, we are working to have uh, also special proteomics uh, obtained by codex samples and in situ sequencing. So, but let's start with the largest cohorts, which is uh, uh, the, the ones that come from from the adult uh, um, pancreatic samples. And uh, in this case, we have collected uh, um, a number of samples from four different anatomical regions of the pancreas, which are the tail, body, head, and then another region, which is called pi pi ridge. That seems to be important in disease context. Uh, we all these samples, we have generated a, a single nuclei RNA-seq and a single nuclei ATAC-seq with a special protocol that allowed us to isolate uh, all uh, the pancreatic cells, uh, all types of pan pancreatic cells. Uh, as you can see on the right part, uh, we have uh, the two data sets that we have generated. So the single nuclei RNA-seq that include uh, more than 400,000 uh, uh, cells across 60 samples. And then uh, the ATAC-seq data set, uh, which include uh, more than 200,000 uh, cells uh, across uh, 400,000 uh, peaks. The peaks uh, are uh, the genomic regions of uh, open chromatin which are important to study and to be characterized for uh, understanding better genomic regulation. Also, from the legend, you will see that we have uh, uh, several cell types and states, and um, maybe you will observe that uh, the majority of the cells are asinar cells. This can be better observed in these bar plots, uh, as you can see, so the light blue are the asinar cells and the, the, the red are the ductal cells. Uh, but also we have uh, uh, other cell many other cell types, including the endocrine compartment that are mainly alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and delta cells. But also we have some stromal cells, endothelial, uh, Schwann, and, uh, and also uh, immune cell types. So uh, in our court, we have, uh, in terms of cell type composition, we observe a quite consistent uh, um, cell type proportion across donors and, um, and samples. And this is uh, also true in the different pancreas uh, regions, uh, except that we observe a slightly increase in the number of endocrine cells in the tail with respect to the head. But this was... Uh, expected. Um, so um, I want to uh, briefly uh, mention that, uh, of course, uh, the, um, uh, the, the building a human cell atlas of the pancreas will require uh, the, a number of uh, analytical steps. And uh, the, the first that we, uh, that we perform as are, let's say, quite standard for any type of, uh, of uh, single cell analysis. So uh, here I mentioned some of those steps, uh, which are, uh, for example, reads quality checks and mapping to generate a gene and peaks count metrics, which are our uh, inputs data. 
And then, of course, uh, we need to filter uh, uh, to filter the peaks and the uh, the genes according to their uh, quality, uh, as well uh, in the case of uh, low quality cells. Of course, uh, then uh, there is uh, an important step of uh, to integrate uh, all the samples together. And uh, this is uh, computationally and uh, analytically challenging because uh, it requires uh, a lot of uh, computational resources. And uh, in this case, uh, we have also applied the step of uh, ambient RNA removal, uh, as well as the removal of the doublet or multi technical multiplet. Because uh, given that we are using a 10 platform, which is a microfluidic technique, we expect uh, in some amount, some of these uh, uh, multiplet in both RNA and ataxic data. Then, of course, uh, uh, given that we have different cores and different conditions, uh, we, 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 are, we are interested in having a consensus cell type annotation across the different data set. And then uh, after that, uh, we can focus uh, on the different downstream analysis uh, that will depend uh, on the biological questions that we want to answer. So, of course, today I won't go uh, across all these uh, steps uh, into the details, but I will try to pick uh, the, 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 the aspects that, that, that can be more interesting uh, for the audience and, uh, uh, and for, uh, for the everyone. So uh, one of the main requirements of any uh, human cell atlas project is the generation of a comprehensive cell type reference map. So in this case, uh, we have decided to include uh, different levels of annotation. So in this case, for example, I'm showing level two and level three of our uh, single cell uh, RNA-seq data. Uh, the level one can be considered as uh, the, the different cell type compartment, uh, sorry, the different cellular compartment, which are the exocrine and endocrine, and then also the immune cells, for example. And then level two will include uh, uh, the majority of the cell types in the pancreas, while a level three will, uh, will represent a deeper look at, the, at, at more substates and uh, more uh, rare uh, subpopulation. Um, as you can see, there are uh, several uh, subtypes of course, then uh, we'll need to uh, understand how are they important at functional level, for example, uh, and the activity of the pancreas. So uh, the generation of these uh, subtypes and sub uh, substates uh, is performed by using an unsupervised clustering. Uh, and then uh, uh, in which we are integrating uh, all the all our uh, samples uh, and then uh, we can uh, um, look at subclusters uh, uh, by within uh, each uh, uh, pancreatic cell type, major cell type um, on, in another case we can also, for example, uh, be interested in uh, uh, characterize better the endocrine cell types, which is a full compartment. So we can uh, take out uh, our uh, uh, endocrine cells and uh, recompute, uh, 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 recompute the clusters uh, based on a different set of highly, of highly variable genes, uh, which are the ones uh, that drive the um, uh, the different populations, and uh, in this way, we might be uh, we might have uh, the chance also to obtain uh, the epsilon populations, the epsilon uh, rare population, as I'm showing here. Uh, of course, uh, all this information uh, is then uh, uh, important to be uh, uh, transferred. In, um, in the ataxic modality. And uh, to do so, we can use, uh, for example, label transferring uh, approaches uh, and uh, obtain uh, all the information that we add in the RNA-seq data in the ataxic compartment. 
So to do so, we have uh, uh, generated, uh, we have implemented our own tool, which is called DeepScore, because it's based on uh, on a deep learning uh, uh, neural network. And uh, uh, this tool allowed us uh, to um, to transfer uh, the cell type annotation, uh, and uh, and of course will offer us will offer us the opportunity to harmonize uh, our uh, uh, cell annotation across uh, samples regions and the different modalities. Uh, okay, beyond the, the um, so in the ataxic data. Uh, beyond the cell type annotation, of course, uh, uh, the analysis of uh, chromatin, open chromatin regions uh, uh, can be much more challenging uh, because uh, uh, the, the majority of the peaks uh, fall within uh, regions that uh, are non-coding regions and, uh, that, uh, and much less is known uh, about them with respect to uh, coding regions, so the, the genes. So one approach that we are using to uh, have uh, a, a better characterization of this uh, um, non-coding region is to link, uh, to link them to uh, target genes that uh, might be important uh, in, a pancreas, uh, in the pancreas, uh, in the biology of the pancreas. For example, uh, in this case, I'm showing that uh, with uh, by looking at the co-accessibility peaks, uh, for example, we can uh, um, investigate uh, about the, the correlation of uh, several peaks uh, with uh, uh, the transcription factor GATA4, which is known to be important uh, for the ACINAR development. Uh, of course, uh, then uh, later uh, is also important to uh, to have uh, nice tools that uh, suited tools that allowed us to to have uh, a good visualization of uh, these uh, co-accessible networks and uh, allowed us also to enable us uh, also to identify uh, clusters of co-accessible peaks, but also quantify uh, their importance by using uh, graph metrics, such as uh, the centrality or uh, closeness, betweenness, uh, and other uh, known metrics. Another way to uh, have a functional annotation of, uh, of uh, our peaks can be, for example, by integrating uh, genome-wide association studies uh, with the peaks. And uh, oh, this is uh, important because, uh, for example, uh, in the diabetes, uh, or, uh, there are many um, uh, many risk variants that have been associated to uh, to this uh, disease, but also to other uh, quantitative traits. Um, so, uh, and uh, many of these uh, of these variants uh, falls uh, within accessible accessible uh, genomic regions. Um, so therefore, uh, uh, it's uh, important to uh, uh, this uh, can can really help us uh, to uh, understand not only the um, not only the uh, the significance of our peaks, but also to link uh, to identify the critical populations that are important for uh, for these diseases. Uh, another uh, take-home message that we uh, obtained from um, from uh, from you from our human pancreas atlas is the fact that despite we we tried to focus on uh, uh, healthy pancreas, uh, the inspection of uh, of uh, the histological. Um, uh, images from uh, expert pathologists uh, told us that uh, uh, many of these uh, pancreas uh, are affected by um, micro lesions or uh, uh, micro pathologies. Uh, as you can see here in this uh, table, 
uh, we uh, have observed that a huge number of uh, our uh, uh, of the samples that we are analyzing uh, are affected by lipomatosis uh, or show it. Uh, um, histopathological features that are close to uh, lipomatosis, so the accumulations of fat in um, in the tissue, fibrosis, which uh, in which uh, uh, is characterized uh, in the accumulation of fibers into the tissue, but also uh, pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasias, uh, which uh, represent a kind of um, uh, pregmalignant. Uh, have been associated to pre-malignant states of uh, um, pancreatic uh, uh, adenocarcinomas. So um, it's clear that uh, uh, a better uh, uh, understanding of this uh, of this um, uh, of this data can offer us uh, the opportunity also to uh, identify uh, pre-malignant states uh, of, uh, in the pancreas uh, and, uh, and maybe connect them with the initiation of uh, diseases or uh, of, of cancer. Um, so, uh, our first look at, at this data, we found that uh, there are changes, uh, for example, in cell type composition in these uh, micropathological samples. We found the higher abundance of macrophages in, in lipomatosis, but also higher abundance of uh, lymphocytes in uh, fibrotic samples. And then uh, apparently uh, we haven't found uh, uh, changes in composition for uh, uh, um, pancreatic uh, uh, intraepithelial neoplasias. Uh, but of note, uh, the integration with uh, uh, pancreatic adenocarcinomas can help us uh, uh, to reconstruct uh, some of the early stages of uh, PDAC uh, initiation. Uh, of course, uh, uh, differential abundance uh, uh, abundance is uh, uh, in different cell types uh, uh, is not the only things that we are interested, in, but also we are uh, we want to check better uh, differences in transcriptional and epigenetic uh, changes of these samples, and. Uh, and uh, this would require a better investigation, but also will will provide us the opportunity to compare uh, um, to compare our data against uh, previously published data set, particularly in fibrosis, which is a highly conserved uh, process. And uh, so maybe we might have uh, um, some states that is also conserved in other uh, in other organs. Uh, this is uh, um, so a nice result that we found, for example, uh, is uh, to find is uh, in the identification of some enrichment in uh, uh, stellate uh, in stellate cells that uh, are in. Uh, mesenchymal cells uh, of uh, uh, that are important cells for fibrosis because uh, uh, these cells seem to transdifferentiate uh, after uh, uh, inflammatory process and uh, are the ones responsible and transform to myofibroblasts that are that are the ones responsible for the accumulation of uh, fibers uh, in the tissue. So uh, a better uh, uh, characterization of these cells can really be relevant and uh, help us to have uh, uh, to advance our knowledge and uh, maybe uh, change some concept uh, in uh, in fibrosis of the um, of the pancreas, but also in uh, in other cons in in other organs. Uh, another aspect that can be relevant uh, is. Uh, um, in uh, in the case of our uh, fetal uh, fetal samples, uh, the temporal single cell an analysis uh, of these uh, samples uh, can help us uh, to reconstruct uh, pancreatic development, uh, which is very important uh, to not only to characterize uh, pancreatic cell type progenitors, but also can help us uh, to. Um, 
to understand uh, and uh, explain better uh, uh, the cellular plasticity in, uh, in, in adult pancreas. Uh, by uh, identifying uh, sig new signaling pathways, for example, that regulated this uh, uh, development. And, um, and then also it can be very relevant also in regenerative medicine. Um, another aspect that, uh, uh, that uh, is very important is also the characterization of the endocrine cells. And uh, uh, particularly in our samples, uh, we have, uh, as I said, uh, we have uh, both uh, healthy and uh, uh, type 2 diabetes uh, samples. So, um, and uh, furthermore, uh, we also included uh, some individuals uh, with uh, impaired uh, uh, fasting glucose uh, that represent a kind of uh, preg malignancies. Uh, uh, pre-diabetic samples. So um, the comparison of these uh, uh, individuals uh, in at highest resolution, as uh, you can see here, we have a uh, uh, different subpopulation of uh, alpha cells, uh, beta cells. Uh, so the special focus will be in this case on the endocrine compartment will help us to have uh, uh, a better characterization of, uh, of these cells uh, across the, this, these different conditions, uh, which and uh, to improve this uh, characterization, also we have performed VASA-seq, uh, uh, we have generated VASA-seq data, which is uh, a new protocol for our single cell rna -seq, for our single cell rna -seq data that uh, allowed us to have the full length transcriptome of, uh, of the endocrine cells in this case. Here I'm showing the, the beta cells and, the, and uh, the fact that I want to emphasize the fact that we can really uh, go into uh, a depth uh, characterization of these cells and their heterogeneity. Uh, that is important to understand better the diseases uh, and the changes that are associated to, uh, to their dysregulation. Uh, of course, uh, uh, these aspects can be uh, can be seen in both uh, RNA and also chromatin accessibility and uh, at different levels of glucose. And uh, here I'm showing particularly uh, some of the changes uh, that we have observed uh, in beta cells uh, uh, in relation to the different levels of uh, of glucose. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, and with this, I want to conclude uh, just giving you a summary of, uh, of the main messages that I wanted to bring uh, in this meeting. So the fact that we have generated a, a comprehensive uh, single cell reference atlas uh, that contain around 1 million of pancreatic cells across uh, uh, 45 uh, healthy adu adults mapped by single, cell, single nuclei RNA-seq and uh, ATAC-seq. Also, we have uh, 10 fetal pancreas mapped by both technologies also here, and then uh, uh, 20 uh, type 2 diabetes uh, um, or uh, pre-malignant pre-diabetic uh, samples uh, that will be compared against the controls adults. Uh, in this case, we have uh, focused, we have isolated uh, the endocrine cells uh, and, um, and performed a single cell RNA-seq, ATAC-seq and VASA-seq. As well, uh, we will have also uh, special information about those. Uh, our results uh, will permit the exhaustive identification and the characterization of more than 50 pancreatic cell types and states, enabling the identification of a previously unappreciated acinar heterogeneity, uh, cell type pancreatic progenitors uh, involved in embryonic development, but also the identification of critical cell types and states associated with the common histopathological features and uh, PDAC initiation, uh, and um, as well as uh, the differential cell type changes in composition and cellular processes, uh, underlying time to diabetes and uh, pre-diabetic samples.
Okay, I want to conclude uh, with the acknowledgement. Um, of course, uh, uh, my group, the Cellular System Genomics Group, but also uh, the whole ESPAS consortium. Um, uh, in this picture uh, that was recently uh, the last meeting, uh, the last final meeting for, uh, for this uh, consortium in Berlin. Uh, and then uh, all the other collaborators and uh, research funding uh, agencies and the, you for the attention. And uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. So thank you, Elisabetta, for this uh, great uh, talk, amazing talk. So of course, we have uh, questions from attendees. Uh, we have here one question from Natalia. Uh, thanks, Elisabetta, for your great uh, talk. Uh, could you discuss about pros and cons on estimating cell type proportion fractions from single cell RNA-seq? Okay, I think, uh, uh, well, if I understand your question, uh, well, of course, uh, I would say that uh, um, uh, there are, uh, uh, well, it depends on the sample uh, the, and the protocol that we, we are applying, or the protocol that we apply to, to our tissue, uh, the, 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 the cell type proportion can be uh, closer to, uh, to, to, to the reality. Uh, in this case, uh, in the case specifically of the pancreas, the protocol that we have applied with the nuclei uh, should be uh, quite consistent uh, with, uh, with the real proportion of the cell types. So in this case, uh, um, I believe that we are uh, in line with the real proportion of uh, pancreatic cell types. But uh, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, it might not be the case uh, or it can be more challenging, uh, for example, with uh, uh, protocols that include the whole single cell. And this is because uh, um, sometimes there are cells that are more prone to die during the experiment. Like uh, for example, in the case of the pancreas, the acinar cells are not always well represented. And uh, for that, uh, our team uh, employed a specific protocol in order to make sure that we could uh, uh, maintain those cell um, alive during the process. But I agree that uh, uh, this might not be the case in other tissues or uh, it's, it will be really depending on the tissue that we are analyzing and on the protocol that has been applied on that. So always it's important to have uh, uh, like a first pilot that allowed you to uh, evaluate the, the different proportions and later, uh, if you are interested in a specific uh, uh, representation of the of some cell types, so maybe you can evaluate uh, uh, which protocol is more optimal for your study. Great, thank you, Isabetta. So, uh, re so regarding the same topic, I, I have a, a, a doubt. Uh, what, what do you use single cell uh, nuclei? Uh, I mean, sometimes, uh, from my understanding, is because there are particular cell that is not so easy to dissociate from, from exactly. tissues. In this case, mm -hmm. it was the reason that was? Yeah, that was the reason, but because uh, the acinar cells are uh, typically uh, tends to, there is a degradation due to the uh, activity to, um, activity of the pancreas or to the function of these acinar cells that make them uh, uh, really fragile and uh, more prone to, uh, to degrade easily. And uh, so with the nuclei, it was easier. Then of course, uh, I haven't performed the experiment, the experiment myself, so I don't know the technical details, but uh, yeah, the reason, the main reason was that one. Okay, that, that, that makes sense. So, uh, okay, we have another question from Patricia. Uh, great talk. Considering the human pancreas atlas, 
how do you describe the current status of the atlas? Uh, well, <laughs> well, this project has started uh, in 2020. Uh, well, I have to say that we were not very lucky in terms of uh, the period that we started the project because uh, after one month that uh, uh, we had the first uh, kickoff meeting, uh, COVID uh, <laughs> arrived. And uh, so we had uh, uh, several problems in collecting tissues, uh, particularly because uh, many samples uh, were from, uh, had to be collected uh, in Italy, uh, others uh, in uh, Netherlands. So we had uh, issues uh, uh, in the organization of, of that. So we have delayed a, a bit uh, all this, these uh, steps. And so finally, we got uh, all uh, the data. Uh, we, we generated all our data. Uh, um, we have finished with the gen data generation uh, at the, um, uh, the end of, well, sorry, uh, before summer. Let's say on June, May, June. So now we are uh, focusing more on the downstream analysis, but of course, uh, all this time also uh, served us to, to, to learn about the pipeline that we wanted to develop. So we have um, like uh, trained us a bit uh, on the integration of uh, the different modalities uh, and all the steps that are necessary. And also we have done a lot of uh, benchmarking uh, protocols at the beginning just to test uh, uh, the goodness of the generated data so these are steps that anyway took at some times uh, uh, now I think that uh, we need just to uh, make an effort to uh, to to sum up uh, all the information that we have uh, and put them uh, uh, in a manuscript <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, so another question from uh, Ricardo. Uh, given your results, which are the most important factors that should be controlled when comparing single nuclei RNA-seq data from pancreas, example, location of sample in the organ, glycemic mm -hmm. state or immune state, uh, etc.? For example, I think that uh, uh, in my opinion, and uh, probably also um, this can be, uh, this is a nice question, <laughs> uh, um, depending also on my uh, interest, I would say that uh, uh, the, the most important factors are the fact that uh, I was not expecting to find uh, uh, micropathologies in healthy pancreas. And uh, this is the, um, uh, the most important aspect because uh, it will help us to describe uh, uh, cellular plasticity uh, of the pancreas uh, that can help us to highlight some uh, inflammatory states that uh, uh, can lead to diseases later in time. Uh, so this is something that really uh, uh, an attractive to um, to understand better because uh, uh, not only uh, in the endocrine compartment, but particularly in the exocrine compartment and their relationship uh, is something that is completely novel and uh, has not been characterized uh, or there are less information about it. Thank you, uh, Elisabetta. So as we have still time, I have mm -hmm. another uh, question. So okay. I, I would like, if, if it's possible, you could elaborate more about the co-accessibility graph mm -hmm. networks from ATAC-SIT. How did you perform this network analysis? What's the input? Uh, data set in order to create okay. these networks? So, uh, as you might know, the ataxic uh, data, um, so, or better, the ataxic technologies are quite uh, recent. So, there are not many packages uh, that 
uh, enable the analysis of ataxic data. So most of uh, the papers that we see in which uh, this technique have been employed, uh, I see that uh, people focus uh, more on the uh, transferring learning from uh, uh, RNA to attack by using uh, uh, the gene activity matrix, uh, which links uh, the, um, the peaks uh, with, the, with the genes that is closest to, uh, to that genomic regions. Uh, so uh, beyond that, uh, I believe that co-accessibility networks uh, is something that uh, can really be informative uh, to characterize the different uh, the different peaks, and uh, uh, to do so, we have used uh, the um, the the input information of the ataxic data, and uh, we have uh, uh, employed the at the moment we have employed the Signac uh, pipeline. Uh, to analyze our peaks, and then on top of that, we have used the Cicero, which is uh, a package that have been implemented in the Trapnel lab to generate uh, our uh, co-accessibility networks, and uh, and uh, and then complemented it uh, with uh, with the rest of information that we had uh, uh, from the RNA, but also from the attack states. Uh, uh, with uh, with Signac, uh, there are many types of analysis that you can do also with the motives uh, uh, and other information. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, mainly for the network, uh, we use the Cicero that allowed you to, and in, the, in that case, the input is the ataxic data only. Yeah, but in that sense, uh, what are the edges? Uh, how, how did you infer the edges? And what about the, 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 the nodes? The notes are, I don't know. It, what, well, what? In, in that case, uh, simply you uh, obtain uh, uh, that the network is intended as uh, um, you mainly uh, check all the. Um, how the peaks uh, infer how the peaks are correlated to each other. So the nodes are the the different uh, the different peaks, and to each of them you assign a, a weight that uh, tells you how close uh, the the two peaks are uh, similar in the co accessibility. It's so a kind of a it's a kind of a correlation graph. Exactly. exactly. And you apply exactly. you put that threshold. Exactly. Uh, between the, the, the edges. Okay, exactly. perfect. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I think that we are uh, now on time. So, once again, thanks a lot, Elisabetta, for this uh, great talk and this insightful talk. And we hope to see you again next year, okay. maybe in this, in this meeting. <laughs> so, thank thanks you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye bye. You. So, thanks. Uh, so now we are going to move uh, for our second uh, uh, talk by uh, Maria Gutierrez. Uh, I'm going to, it's my pleasure to introduce Maria. Uh, Maria obtained her bachelor degree in genomic science at the UNAM, National University of Mexico. She completed her PhD at the University of Geneva in the Dermisakis lab and her postdoctoral training at the Raishaunduri lab at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She is now assistant professor in the Division of Immunology, Department of Pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. So thank you, Maria, for being here uh, today with us and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you for the opportunity to present our work here today. Um, okay, can you see my slide well? Yes. Great. So today I'm going to talk to you about a project that uh, we published a couple of years ago in Nature Immunology. This was a collaboration uh, between my postdoc lab in Shomori Chowdhury's lab and, and Patrick Brennan, who's at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, and he's a, an, an immunologist. And in this project, um, we were very interested in, in these innate T cells. So for those of you who are not so familiarized uh, with T cells, 
there's the conventional CD4 and CD8 T cells that are the most widely studied and they can, their T cell receptors allow them to recognize a wide variety of peptide antigens uh, that are presented by antigen presenting cells with MHC class two molecules. And uh, in AT cells, on the other hand, they're, they've been less studied because they're less frequent in blood, uh, but they play important roles in, in cancer, in allergy, and other immune mediated diseases. Um, and what is particular about them, they're called innate T cells because uh, they can be activated uh, with uh, cytokines without the need of stimulating the T cell receptor. So this, this is more similar to the innate immune system, uh, but also they, they can re recognize different types of antigens. So for example, uh, INK T cells, they recognize lipid antigens that are presented by CD1D. Uh, mate cells, they recognize uh, vitamin B derivatives that are presented by MR1. And then there's these gamma delta T cells that are uh, expressing another type of T cell receptor, this the gamma delta T cell receptor. And uh, they're, what antigens they see uh, are is not yet super well characterized yet, but, but they, they're pertain to this group of innate T cells. And there's others, of course. Um, so we were interested in characterizing transcriptomically these cells. Um, and with the hypothesis that their shared effector capabilities of these innate T cells could be driven by a common transcriptional program. Uh, so what we did is for six healthy individuals, we collected PBMCs, so per peripheral blood uh, mononuclear cells. And we used uh, flow cytometry to uh, sort these seven immune cell subsets. So we have the four innate T cell subsets I told you about, and we have the CD4 T cells and the CD8 T cells to compare them with their adaptive counterparts. And then we chose to include the natural killer cells as the innate uh, comparator. And first we performed low input RNA seq um, on, on these samples. So, so with low input RNA seq, you can do RNA seq with 1000 cells per sample. And we included duplicates uh, per individual. So basically for each cell type, you have about 12 samples because it's six donors times two uh, duplicates. And later we did our uh, single cell RNA seq, which I will talk about in a couple of slides. So I just wanted to show you here our gating strategy. Um, and basically what's important is that the mate cells were selected with, with an MR1 specific tetramer. Um, and well, we made sure that these populations were as pure as possible. So the first thing we did is with this R low input RNA seq data is we quantified gene expression levels and then we chose the top about the top 1000 most variable genes across the whole data set and then we performed a PCA and as you can see on PC1 which is explaining 16 percent of the variance you have the CD4 and CD8 T cells on, on one extreme of PC1 and then the NK cells on the other extreme of PC1 and then in between you have the NA T cells uh, and if we if we put here the PC1 scores by the cell type, and then we sort it by each, each cell type, like what their PC1 scores was, you can see that there's this continuous gradient that goes from the most adaptive to the most innate, right? And then all these innate T cells in between, and they do seem to have like a, like a, a hierarchy here. Uh, so, we started calling this the innateness gradient because it was going from most adaptive to most innate. And we wanted to know what was behind this PC1, what, um, yeah, what is explaining PC1 and this, this gradient. So what we did is uh, we used linear mixed models to see, to identify the genes that were associated with this gradient. So what we did is, we assign each of these cell types based on their ranking on PC1. So on, on this PC1, 
based on the ranking, we assign them CD4 is one, CD8 is two, three, four, five, six, seven, four in case. So we wanted to know which genes are associated with this gradient. Um, and we, yeah, as I said, we used linear mixed models and we added donor as a random effect. And we found about 1000 genes that were associated with innateness. So they were, they had higher expression on, on the innate, more innate like side, as you can see here. And then we found 797 genes that we started calling the adaptiveness genes because they were more highly expressed on the adaptive side and more lowly expressed on the innate side. So here's just a, a general vision of all of these genes. Well, this is a, a subset of the protein coding genes, and then these are all the link RNA genes we, we saw that, that are following this gradient. So these are the innateness genes, these are the adaptiveness genes. So our next question was, okay, what is behind, what pathways or, or what sort of genes do we find behind the, the genes that are the innateness genes? So the, the ones that are more expressed in innate, um, on the more innate side of the gradient. And uh, we saw that one of the top uh, pathways was NK, NK mediated immunity and cellular defense response. And in this volcano plot, uh, I'm showing here on the on the x axis is the beta, so it's the almost like the full change associated with with the innateness level. Where on the right side you have more innate, like it's, it means it's more highly expressed on the innate side. On the left side is more highly expressed on the adaptive side. Um, and then on on red is the significant genes that pass the Bonferroni threshold. Uh, for the p-value, and then on yellow, uh, sorry, on blue, we have the genes that are, pertain to these two pathways that I'm um, describing here. Uh, so you can see there's a clear bias towards the right-hand side of the volcano plot, confirming the enrichment for innateness for these path for genes in this pathway. And then here I'm just highlighting some of the genes here with the higher full changes, which include grinds and B, tyro BP, granulysin, perforin one and some key uh, natural killer cell receptors. Um, so these are known genes to, to, be, um, to be like more effector type of genes in the immune system. So this, this made sense. And then something that was also interesting is uh, cytokines are generally lowly expressed. So it was harder to find like individual cytokines to be to have a significant p-value with innateness. But if we sum up the expression of all of the cytokines, you can see that the total cytokine mass is, is following this gradient too, where, where uh, CD4s and T8s have like lower expression levels of cytokines compared to, to the more innate side. And this, these observations then prompted us to do some uh, experimental experiments, uh, well, more like, uh, yeah, it's more uh, Patrick Brennan who did these immunology and molecular biology experiments to to try to to see what it, like to validate these findings and and see how how does that reflect function of these cells. So we did validate a lot of these uh, gradient gradient like uh, expression at the protein level. So he did a lot of uh, validations. Uh, at the protein level. And then what was interesting, I don't have time to show the details of this, but he showed that the interferon gamma uh, levels, this is a cytokine, um, the interferon gamma levels in the cells are there as preformed mRNA. So they're, they're, they have higher expression levels or on the innate side. Uh, and it's, it's as though like the, the RNA is already there ready to be translated um, because if he blocked, uh, he did experiments where he blocked transcription or he blo uh, blocked translation. And then we saw that this was preformed mRNA uh, that was ready to be translated. So the fact that the more innate side has higher levels of interferon might mean that the cell is on purpose, like putting uh, those genes upregulated so that you can uh, respond to, a, to an immune stimulus faster. 
Um, and then also uh, we observe that active translation increases with innateness. And then we ask what is associated with the adaptiveness genes, so those that were more highly expressed in CD8 and, and, and CD4 T cells. And we saw the top go term was uh, ribosomal, ribosomal terms. Uh, so we saw a lot of ribosomal protein coding genes. Um, and then we also saw some elongation, uh, translation elongation factors. And, and also the top transcription factor that was associated with adaptiveness was MIC. So we were trying to make sense of what, what does all of this mean? Uh, and we realized that, okay, maybe the, the adaptive side is prioritizing more proliferation because if you're prioritizing higher expression of ribosomal protein genes, maybe uh, you want to make sure that you have, um, yeah, you, you're ready to, to divide and proliferate. Um, and so Patrick tested whether, whether the, the cells uh, were proliferating more uh, in, in the adaptive side of, of, of the gradient. And, and that's what that we found that if you see here, the division index of CD4 and CD8 T cells is higher than the innate T cells. So in, in summary, uh, what we found of this transcriptional innateness gradient is that the more you are expressing this transcriptional program, the more you're prioritizing effector transcriptome, the effector transcriptome, uh, which leads to early cytokine production and makes sense uh, given what is known of these innate like cells. Uh, and then the, the more you're, you're repressing this program, you're actually upregulating, you're, you're prioritizing more like uh, translational machinery transcripts, and this helps you in your proliferative capacity. So what we did then is we devised a, uh, a score uh, that taking information from hundreds of genes, it could tell us what is the innate state of a given sample or a, a given cell. And then we use public data sets to, to try to see how this innateness score was behaving in, in, in different disease contexts or, or uh, um, immune subset contexts. So here I'm just showing a little bit more details of this innateness score. So how we did this is we went back to our original PCA and uh, for PC1, we have the gene loadings, right? Of, of how much each gene is contributing to PC1, either positively or negatively. So you have the gene loadings for these genes that we use, the top 1000 variable genes. And then what we do is in whatever data set we're analyzing, we are taking the gene loadings as a weight. And so we just multiply the weight by the expression level of that gene in that, in that cell or sample in this data set we're testing. And then what we do is we just sum sum up the, the product of this, and that is the innate score. So uh, what we did next is we did a single cell RNA-seq experiment where we're also using cell hashing. So just to summarize what this means is we are using antibodies that bind uh, a very general protein that is ex expressed in all of the cells, but then uh, it, in, in group A, you have a, a, a certain barcode. In group B, you have a different barcode. In group C, you have a, a different barcode, right? So you stain your cells when they're separated in these different groups with these antibodies, and then you can pull them, and then uh, you, you can build, uh, well, you, you pass them through the 10X machine, and you can build libraries that are in parallel for RNA, and then the library for these uh, hashtag oligos that will tell you uh, for each cell, which group it came from originally. So we basically repeated the same experiment we did at low input, where we sorted the seven immune cell types. And we did this for two individuals, two healthy individuals. And so here you, you can see we did, we applied again, we saw the variable genes, we applied PCA, and uh, we did UMAP on the top 20 PCs to visualize the data. And you can see on the left side here, you have the CD4 and CD8 T cells. 
here in the middle, you have uh, the NKT and mate cells uh, with some gamma deltas between here and here, and uh, V delta ones here. And then on the, on the right-hand side, you have the NK cells. So if we use our innateness score and we color each cell by, by this innateness score, you can see that uh, it's replicating what we had observed in the low input data with lower innateness scores for CD4s and CD8s and higher, and then there's a gradient and then higher innateness scores for the NK cells. And what is valuable about single cell data, as you all know, is, uh, you can now look at heterogeneity within cell subsets, right? So uh, what we first did is we we performed clustering. We found these, there's these four main uh, clusters or, or groups that are telling us, well, maybe there's like four main innateness states. Um, and then we saw, we started observing that, let's say within CD8s, you could find cells that are in cluster one, but also some that are in cluster two and some that are in cluster three. So there's variability uh, in the innateness state within CD8 T cells. Um, and then here I'm showing the same, but uh, for all of the cell types. So you can see for V delta one T cells, you have some here up in cluster one, uh, a couple in cluster two and most of them in cluster three. And so you can see how this the cell types, there's variability within each cell type uh, across the innateness spectrum. So we wanted to uh, use public data sets to validate these findings. So first we used a microarray public data set where they had isolated uh, these different subsets of CD8 T cells. Um, so they had naive CD8 T cells uh, from four people and then they had memory CD8 T cells that were specific for this virus, HCMV, and then effector CD8 T cells that were specific for this virus. And, and you can see how the innate score for, for each of these samples of these CD8 subsets is, is, uh, is different with the, indeed the effector CD8 T cells have a higher innate score. So this is just confirming that this innateness program is even variable within a cell type and uh, and it can, depending on how much you turn it on or you turn it off, it, it can um, influence what type of, of CD8 T cell you are. So we also wanted to look at this in disease states. So first we took this public low input RNA-seq data where they were quantifying different CD4 T cell subsets in arthritis patients. And in this paper, they had found that this subset, the CD4, the uh, positive 27 negative um, subset was expanded in rheumatoid arthritis patients. So this was more frequent in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And if we, if we calculate the innate score per sample, you can see again, there's this gradient within CD4 subsets. And then the highest innate score was for the, the subset that was expanded in rheumatoid arthritis patients. So I guess it makes you uh, wonder like how, how this innateness program involved in rheumatoid arthritis. And, and then we also took a, a big, uh, well, at the time it was big, single cell data set from breast cancer patients where they had uh, taken biopsies from normal breast tissue and from the tumor. And, and then they isolated the immune cells so we took the we looked at the T cells. So there were seventeen thousand uh, breast T cells, and then we asked, are the T cells that were in the tumor do they have higher innate score than the nor than the normal T cells in the normal t uh, tissue or breast tissue? And the answer is yes. So the tumor T cells have higher innate uh, that their innateness program is slightly more turned on. So to summarize. Um, the, so we discovered that lymphocytes align along a transcriptional gradient reflecting the innateness state. So the more innate you are, the more you have turned on your effector transcriptome and this allows for early cytokine production. And then the more adaptive you are, you're prioritizing more ribosomal machinery transcripts and it helps you for your proliferative capacity. And then finally, we saw also that 
in a, in a state in T cells, it, it can vary within CD4 and CD8 T cells subpopulations, and it's in, it's increased in autoimmune pathogenic subset and in the tumor microenvironment. And so what, uh, yeah, what, what I wanted to also talk about like more like other types of impact of, of having this, this um, concept of the transcriptional program that might be more turned on or off. Uh, so Aparna Nathan in the Rich Allery lab, she, uh, well, she worked in this huge study, single cell RNA-seq study where they had almost half a million memory T cells from 257 individuals from Peru. Uh, a subset of them, uh, well, all of them had been exposed to tuberculosis. Some of them had active disease. And, uh, and then she plotted, uh, she colored the cells by, again, by the innateness score. So you can see there's, again, here, there's a gradient on the innateness score. And then because uh, they have so many individuals and they ha have genotyped these individuals, they can look at how genetic variants are associated with gene expression. And then here's just an example of a genetic variant associated with gene expression of a nearby gene here on this extreme of the, of the innateness score, where you can see it's, it's like a, a large effect of this genetic variant on gene expression. Whereas if you take cells from the other extreme with low um, innateness score, you see that the same variant and the same gene, the, the effect is changing. So it's less extreme in this case. So this is telling us that this, it, it's, it was like a context specific or cell state dependent genetic regulatory effect and this innateness score uh, can help us determine the, the, the state at which a cell is in and, and predict how a genetic variant will affect gene expression. Uh, so I want to thank everyone that was involved in this study, uh, particularly uh, Shomo Richaudhary, my postdoc advisor, and Patrick Brennan. Uh, and then I, I started my lab at Children's um, just like over a year and a half ago. And I just wanted to briefly tell you about our research directions. So my background is very strongly on genetics. So we're very interested in leveraging genetic variation to dissect the chain of events that lead to disease. So we're going to be looking at this. If, if risk variants for disease, how do they uh, affect gene expression levels in particular cell states? Uh, what is the mechanism that is leading to this gene expression level change? Just want to look at the time, okay. Uh, for example, this variant could affect the binding of a transcription factor, and then and that that might lead to this genetic regulatory effect. And then we want to study how these events lead to downstream intermediate immunophenotypes, and then to try to explain better how this leads to disease. And we have a very strong focus of this in lupus. We're studying B cells uh, in the context of lupus because for for lupus, uh, genetically speaking. Um, B cells are one of the most relevant cell types. And we also have a parallel direction in the lab where we want to use multi-omics to understand cell states and how they get altered in disease. Um, so we have a lot of collaborations with people that work in immune-mediated diseases like asthma and allergic diseases, access bondular arthritis, um, tuberculosis, MISI, um, and yeah, basically here we either compare patients and controls or different subsets of patients. And we try to quantify uh, cell state frequency or transcriptional program sc score that can allow us to, to know what is altered in disease. But, and, and these, I see these two directions as complementary because here, if you see a difference between patients and controls, you don't know if it's a causal thing for the disease or a consequence of the disease. But then if we mix this with genetics, uh, we can, it can tell us what, what are the causal the, the causal drivers of disease and and what are more likely like the consequences of of disease. So this is my lab uh, here in Boston, and thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions and feel free to write to me if you're interested in learning more about what we do. Hey, thank you, Maria, for your great talk. So of course we have. Uh, Questions. Uh, first question is uh, from Martin. 
uh, he said, uh, when you calculate the inhalants using the PCA's loadings, do you take into account the sign of the loading? As far as I know, the sign of the loadings is meaningless. How will you this affect your scoring method of the inhalants? Um, yeah, we do take into account the, the sign of the loading. Um, it's a good question. Like the sign is meaningless. I actually, I didn't know this. So I will go back and check how including or excluding the sign would change this. Um, but it, I feel like it is mean, meaning because uh, it's telling you like the combination of these gene loadings is telling you your PC1 score, right? So, so that the genes that are contributing positively to PC1, so more the innateness side are, are going to have a positive gene loading, whereas the genes that are contributing more towards the adaptiveness side, so the, the left side of the PC1 will, will have a negative one. So, but I can double check. Yeah, it's a great question. Perfect. So, um, let's see, uh, from Gamal, uh, Maria, are you interested in studying ciliopathies? Uh, ciliopathies. Uh, I haven't thought about that disease, but <laughs> but yeah, I'm flexible about what we apply our strategies to which biological systems and diseases. So yeah, please reach out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, another question. Uh, in the study addressing individuals exposed to tuberculosis, did you consider the effect of ancestry environment? If not, could it be possible with the current data sets? Uh, okay, sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, sure. Uh, in the study addressing individuals exposed to mycobacterium tuberculosis, did you consider the effect of ancestry environment if not, will it be possible with the current data sets? Okay. Uh, yeah, so they did, I didn't participate in that specific study, but they did take into account the, the ancestry. They included, I think at least five genotyping PCs for, for identifying the, the EQTLs, the associations between genetic variants and, and gene expression. Cool. So uh, I, I have I have a, 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 a very quick question for you. I, I, I perceive that in your plot, you identify several gradient states, right? That you mentioned. How important are these gradient states in your biological questions, in, in your biological uh, uh, system? I, I, I think because maybe it is possible to track new cell types or how did you interpret interpretate that? gradient states under the light of your biological question? Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it's interesting. So what we've been observing is like, um, the more you have this program turned on, you have, you're falling into a different cell state. And then that, for me, that's telling you how much you're prioritizing res rapid response versus just proliferating and then doing a slower response where you're yeah. signaling more uh, cells that there's an infection. So, um, yeah. So I think the the experimental work, like the more functional immunology assays, it was really amazing how they were really uh, capturing the the they were respecting these gradient the hierarchy of the gradient where where you were at, at transcriptionally okay. so i think this is a way of cells you like fine tuning their regulatory programs mm -hmm. to to make them do like this very specific functions right okay thank you so thank you maria again for your great talk and if anyone have any other questions please Feel free to add in the in the chat and directly to the to the speakers. Okay, thank you, thank Maria. Thank you for the questions. Bye bye. Great talk. Bye bye. So um, thank you. Uh, so we are going to move to the another question uh, presentation uh, by uh, Claudia uh, Chica.
So Claudia is a team leader in the bioinformatics and biostatistics hub and at Institute Pasteur that she joined in, in 2015. She's a biologist with a mathematical and computational background, passionate about the quantification of biological information, in particular, epigenome-based regulation at the bulk and single cell uh, uh, level. Often uh, she organized, uh, she uh, um, preparing trainings to build the bioinformatics capacity in the Pasteur International Network and in Latin America. So Claudia, thank you for being here with us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Jessica. So I'm gonna share my screen. See if it works, it's okay. Perfect. Okay. So let me put this over here so that doesn't bother us. Okay, so thank you for the presentation and thank you for having me here to present you um, our experience at the Institut Pasteur for the Single Cell Initiative. Um, so uh, in my talk, well, in my talk, I will be uh, presenting two sides of the single cell at the Institut Pasteur. On the one side, who and how we are doing, we are dealing with the, with the projects. And on the second part, I will present you a couple of examples to, to show the kind of projects we're dealing with. Um, so uh, as the single cell, it's a very nice example of how important are the technological platforms to develop new technologies in research institutes. In our case at the Institut Pasteur, it was thanks to uh, a group of people uh, coming from two different platforms. On the one side for the wet lab, the cytometry and biomarkets unit, um, at the UTEX, I will mention it very frequently. And then on the other side, uh, my platform, the Bioinformatics and Biostatistics Hub. So, and it was thanks to this collaboration that we were able to put together um, these uh, ongoing activities on single cell. So uh, we all know, and to this uh, auditorium, I don't want to go into the details of all the technologies that have been arriving for single cell in the past 10 years, but I want to use this timeline to present you how these technologies we uh, introduced at Institut Pasteur. Uh, at the beginning, it was single uh, research units that were bringing the machines, but it was only when all the machines were put together at the CBU text that we could really democratize the technology for, um, uh, for all the research units at Institut Pasteur. And this is clearly seen by the number of projects that we started to have since uh, 2018, um, both at the CBU text and at the hub being submitted. And at that time, we realized that it was important for us to um, put together and to couple our, our efforts of the two platforms in order to, to be able to tackle this growing need. So what did we do? We did something as simple, as, as powerful, as sitting together all uh, in the same table, together with the researchers uh, at the onset of the, of the projects. So we develop one single entry point for the researchers, and then we plan a, a first meeting where we discuss the experimental uh, design details, as well as uh, the questions, the biological questions that they want to uh, answer. Then the researchers perform their, um, their experiments in the wet lab at the CBU text independently or helping. Uh, and then they, they do the data analysis together with us at the hub either um, a standard unsupervised analysis, so we can push the analysis a bit more towards modeling or integration. Um, so by working together, the people of the two platforms, there have been other actions that have risen, like uh, the setting up of a training for the uh, PhD course that is given yearly at the NC2 Pasteur. So now we have one single rna seq module that is two days hands-on course, uh, where five researchers uh, from the hub and the CBU text participate. And additionally, the development of an interactive um, a tool, a shiny application that's called Schnapps, that facilitates uh, greatly the exploration and the first steps of analysis for the wet lab uh, researchers and has optimized a lot the interaction between with the wet lab and the computational side of the, um, of the work. Um, so for the second part of my talk, I will present you a couple of examples uh, of projects that uh, show the breadth of the project we've been dealing with. So one of the first uh, collaborations we had 
was a collaboration with Lucy Peduto and Dual Dahari in the Department of Immunology. Uh, in their lab, they're interested in studying the peri perivascular mesenchymal cells, which are cells that on the steady state provide scaffold and are important for the homeostasis of the, of the tissues. But upon injury, they regulate the, um, the behavior between repair or fibrosis. So in particular, uh, they wanted to characterize a subset of adipo uh, adipocyte progenitor that had been identified previously, uh, and in particular, a subset ex uh, expressed in the ADAM12 uh, protein, which is a transmembrane protein that has protein as, uh, a protease or cell addition functions. So basically, they sort the, the, the cells, the adipose cells, they enrich for mesenchymal uh, cell types with marker genes, and they were able also to enrich for ADAM uh, plus, ADAM12 uh, expressing cells by using GFP. And then they performed MARSIC on uh, more or less 5,000 cells. Together, so we were able to identify five distinct subpopulations, and one of these subpopulations with a distinct uh, ADAM12 uh, signature. And then by doing marker analysis and functional analysis, we could further um, characterize these two populations. And we found that there are multiple adipocyte progenitor cells apart from the ADAM12 uh, adipocyte progenitor um, uh, population and some uh, adipocyte regulators as well as some uh, mesothelial cells. We realized that some of these adipocytes had different signatures of different stages of differentiation. So this uh, prompted us to, to, re to perform a lineage tracing analysis um, on, the, on the population. So from the static snapshot, now we get some sort of um, prediction of the dynamics, the developmental dynamics. And indeed, we were able to identify two trajectories, both starting at the ADAM12 adipocyte progenitors. And um, also, uh, we could uh, identify the driving genes of the, 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 predict the driving genes of these trajectories. So here you have all the cells organized by the pseudo time in the trajectory one. And, and you see that you have some genes that are uh, highly expressed at the beginning, among them are ADAM12 and all the marker genes, that then get um, um, the down-regulated during the, uh, the development. So this trans uh, transcriptional dynamics uh, could be tested experimentally by DUA on, on mice in vivo. And uh, we, they could actually recapitulate this behavior on ADAM12 expressing cells, the GFP positive cells, with high expression at the beginning of the development and uh, down regulation by the uh, eighth week. And additionally, also using uh, published uh, data, uh, we could also see that ADAM12 is associated, the expression of ADAM12, the level of expression is associated with differential metabolic health in uh, lean, healthy patients. Uh, you see here that Adam, uh, the expression of ADAM12, high, uh, high expression, low expression, and you see that the set of genes that are associated, uh, th those are all metabolically relevant genes that are associated with these different um, levels of expressions is different. So this could explain how these patients um, are actually uh, uh, answering to a perturbation like diabetes or obesity. So for the second project, I will show you something that is much more work in progress. It's a collaboration with Glenda Komai and uh, her PhD student, Amarie Korp. Um, they're in, in the Department of Developmental Stem Cell Biology. So they're interested in the cell fate decisions, in particular in muscle stem cells. And they want to uh, characterize how the embryonic origin or the anatomical location of these stem cells determines um, their fate. So in a recent uh, publication, they, they could identify bipotent progenitors that can give rise either to a connective tissue or to myogenic muscular tissue, depending on the group of uh, transcription factors that get activated. So they wanted to further understand the mechanisms uh, that differentiate some um, two kinds of muscular tissue, the cranial muscles that are in pink here versus the trunk or limb muscles that are here in red. So for, for this project, they isolated myonucleide of the two kinds of uh, cell populations in the trunk and the cranial. And they performed both RNA-seq and single nuclei RNA-seq and ataxic in 10,000 cells, more or less. So for the single nuclei RNA-seq, um, we could uh, identify the, um, the signatures that identify my, my, uh, muscle or myocytes in, in the two populations. And we try to do a, a very um, naive 
uh, sort of mapping of these uh, signatures on the single nuclei ataxic uh, data set. Um, what you can see here is the accessibility of the promoters of the genes that are belonging to the signatures. Here you have just three of the 20, 25 genes that we use. And you can see that these genes are actually, the promoters of these genes seem to be um, con con constantly and uh, coherently open in uh, some of the clusters of the single nuclei ataxic, both for the EOM and for the TA datasets. So from these, we were able to, within each one of the single nuclei ataxic, identify the clusters that are actually myocyte and have myocyte uh, sort of activity uh, in both data sets. And from there, we perform a transcription factor enrichment analysis to be able to identify the transcription factors that are uh, specifically accessible in this uh, red and pink cluster. We could identify a set of transcription factors that are common to the two um, uh, subpopulations, which is to be expected because they are all uh, both myocytes. But we'd also identify um, transcription factors that are specifically uh, enriched in the TA uh, clusters or in the EOM uh, myocytes uh, clusters. And we are now trying to, to look at the differential activity using a different approach, the Cronvar approach of some of these specific transcription factors. And here the, 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 the picture is a bit less clear uh, because what you have here basically is the differential activity of these transcription factors in the different clusters. And here you have the expression from the single nuclei at, uh, rna seq data. So you see that the specific, uh, some of the specific transcription factors indeed are expressed only in, t in, in one of the um, subpopulations, but the accessibility is not as sharp um, as uh, we would expect. So we are now uh, trying different ways of trying to do the joint analysis of these uh, uh, two data sets with the challenge that um, they were not produced jointly, they are separated, so we need to try different approaches. Um, so from till now, I have shown you how we have gone from smoothie uh, transcriptomics to sort of fruit uh, salad transcriptomics. And the latest um, approaches we've been trying is to try to go for uh, fruit tart uh, transcriptomics, where basically you are interested in identifying the different cell types, but also the correlations among these cell types within the context of the tissue. So as we all know, this is done using spatial transcriptomics, where you take a slice of the tissue, um, you uh, uh, stain it and permeate it so that you can add a uh, specific barcodes that allow you to uh, map the expression with the specific uh, localization in the, in, the, in the tissue. So for well-known tissues like the brain mouse, um, the analysis is straightforward in the sense that it can be done with standard single cell uh, approaches. So we try clustering of the, of the different spots. Um, we identify clusters with specific uh, transcriptomic profiles, and those clusters can be then mapped back to the, to the tissue. And then of each one of the clusters, you can choose some of the marker genes to identify uh, and localize them specifically in the, in the tissue. The point is that in the, in the institute, we have people using these kind of approaches, but in a different context. This is the case of Anne Schmidt and Lea Torque in the Department of Developmental Cell Cell Biology, where they are studying hematopoietic stem cells. And they, want to use, uh, you, they wanted to do this at the level of the whole organism, which is perfectly possible given the size of zebra fish. Um, but we run into a problem, which is that the, the spot uh, resolution is sometimes bigger than the organs that uh, we are interested in, in studying meaning that the clustering approach is too coarse because we have different cell types in each one of the spots. And uh, we had to approach this problem, uh, Olivier is approaching this problem, like in a, in a more deconvolution uh, approach. So what we are trying, it's independent component analysis for this, where you have the, the expression matrix where you have the genes and the different spots. And uh, from this, you do this uh, factorization uh, matrix approach that allows you to separate your matrix in two matrices, the meta cell matrix, where you have the components that represent the, the transcriptomic profiles and the meta gene matrix, where you have the, the components that represent, the, represent the, how important are each one of the genes in defining each one of the meta sets. So from one scenario where we have um, read counts localized to a given slide of, of tissues, these are all little 
uh, slices of tissues, we, um, we can translate this into projecting now the metacells. So now we are uh, showing how important or how present are the different metacells, in this case, the ribosomal and the liver metacell in each one of the small tissues and um, pieces of tissue. And then you can uh, plot for each one of the, the slices of tissue, the expression of uh, specific marker genes. This is for the ribosomal metacell and for the liver metacell and identify uh, some genes that are mostly expressed in one of the, of the slices. So what we are trying to, what Olivier is trying to do now is to uh, automatize this mapping between the transcriptomic characterization that we are obtaining with the uh, independent component analysis to the imaging that we are getting also from the from the experimental lab. Uh, so with this, I, I can finish. I hope that I have shown you how important are the uh, is the collaboration between different platforms and sustainable platforms. That, that is to say, platforms where you have people that can stay for longer and can develop uh, their own projects uh, in collaboration between each other. And I have presented you how we've been riding the single cell wave at the Institute Pasteur with um, some examples of projects that we've been dealing with, ranging from transcriptomics, epigenomics, and spatial transcriptomics. So with this, I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. I think. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Claudia, for your great presentation. So oh, now we have time for, for questions. I have, I would like to know. There are none. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I have questions. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so it, it's more uh, in terms of administrative, you are in a, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a in, in the main platform at Institute mm -hmm. Pasteur in Paris, or is your platform in different uh, uh, campus of Institute Pasteur around the world? It, uh, no, no. The, the, the platform is physically and it's working mostly with researchers at the Situ Pasteur in, in, in Paris. Okay. We have some uh, um, collaborations with the Situ Pasteur in the international network. They are mostly um, uh, training collaborations or mentoring collaborations. So researchers that come and uh, do together with us in collaboration with us on some projects. But we are mainly working with the uh, and see two pastel researchers okay. in Paris. Got it, got it. Uh, uh, how is the training or education plan uh, at your department? I mean, maybe now everyone knows single cell and everyone everyone mm -hmm. applied uh, a single cell research in their projects. But let's say five years ago, 10 years ago, maybe mm -hmm. when this was a completely new technology, how else when you begin, when you start with this, department and uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 in particularly talking about single cell training for the so something that we have realized is that uh, the best thing you can do at least mm -hmm. in our context is to train phd students because that, the phd students are going to train their mentors and mentor and, <laughs> and and that's the best way to get to the really the, is the good target uh -huh. So um, very early, I didn't show you the details of how uh, of the missions we have as a platform within Pasteur, but let's say that, I mean, 70% of the time we spend it doing projects, but we have some sort of uh, between uh, 10 and 15% of our time, of, of everybody's time that is spent in training. So we are responsible for organizing the, the um, PhD courses. Uh, we have a statistics sort of um, uh, training program and then a bioinformatics training program. And it's within this bioinformatics training program that we inserted the single cell, um, the single cell module. And this was, I have to say, very recent. Uh, let's say that, that was uh, um, very early in the times of single cell for Pasteur because we started with that course in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there were not so many projects at that time, but uh, since so thanks to this course and thanks to the fact that now we have this collaboration between the two platforms that has uh, led to, to democratizing and now most of the units are using, uh, um, there are many more units that are using single cell and then trying new techniques and, and they feel comfortable because they feel that they have the knowledge in-house to try a new technique, you know, and, and, and to give it a try, even if, if it's, they are not super sure about the experiment they are going to do. 
Great. Yeah, this, this is so important for us here in Latin America mm -hmm. because here this is a, a, a let's say a, a new field in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And it's so nice to know these previous experiences from, from, from you, because as you say, it's, it's, it's so important to train in first the PhD students. That's a really nice uh, 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 to know uh, these kind mm -hmm. of experiences. So we have another uh, uh, questions. Okay, uh, Claudia, thank you. Does the joint platform collaborate with researchers, students from other countries? If yes, how would that work? <laughs> I I would I would love to, be, to tell you <laughs> yes, but uh, unfortunately the so the experimental platform does. The experimental platform is able to to deal with projects from, coming from outside, and it would work as a collaboration. And then it depends on the kind of uh, agreement you have, um, the, the kind of budget you have, and so on and so forth. But sorry, but, but, it, the... it, 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 but it is necessary to be in the Pasteur network? Or... No. OK. So these people, the, 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 CBU, the CBU Tech people, they can deal with projects coming from almost anywhere. Now, they wouldn't take anything, but, but then you need to pay as an external, which is a slightly different thing, okay. but it's not uh, super expensive. Now, for the for the computational side, for the computational side, it's a bit more complicated because we need to have a researcher from Pasteur who's um, submitting the project to the hub. So I I do have some collaborations with people from Latin America, but let's say I do it that on my free time. Uh, the, the official way is that um, th there is a collaboration with someone from Pasteur. And we have examples like that, people coming from other, from other institutes in Paris and in the network. They have a collaboration with someone in, in Pasteur and then they can submit the project and we can collaborate in the project, no problem for the bioinformatics part. Okay, thank you. So another question from Marcela. A great presentation, Claudia, many thanks. Have you explored single cell epigenomic approaches? So um, with, the, with the project of, uh, of uh, the muscle uh, stem cells, um, indeed, there it's, it's our first approach of uh, uh, epigenomic approaches. So we've done the typical Signac sort of approach for getting the fragments, getting the peaks, and trying to get this uh, differential accessible and differential um, enriched. Uh, differential accessible peaks and differential enriched transcription factors. Um, we want to move now to multi-ohm sort of approaches, but this particular project doesn't allow us to do that because as I told you, the data was not, it, it is not fair. It's taken on different subpopulations that have slightly different um, uh, composition of the subpopulations. Uh, and the typical integration approaches do not behave very well because they are looking for anchors and these anchors, when you have a missing subpopulation, do not behave very well. So what we are trying to do now with the new people coming from Cold Spring Harbor is to, uh, to try approaches like scenic or, um, yeah, I think that we will go for, for the scenic sort of approach. There is on the, on the pipes another project which is a, a strictly multi ohm uh, project that it's dealing with something similar to what Maria present. It's a memory in NK cells. And there we will have both the transcriptome and the ataxic data coming from the same cell. So I'm really looking forward to that project to be able to, to apply more, um, more formal uh, multi-modal approaches. Um, Thank you, Claudia. Uh, yeah, and I, I Marcela now one. say, yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. So uh, once again, thank you, Claudia. And, and thank and you for hope, the invitation. I'm very to have, happy to, to have. Yeah, you we hope to have you. collaborations with you in terms of training here in Latin America. Why not? Cool. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Claudia. Bye bye. So thank you uh, to all the speakers. Now I'm going to pass the mic to uh, Vinicius who is going to moderate the next uh, talks. So thank you, Vinicius, and thank you all, and please enjoy the, 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 the symposium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sid. Thank you, all the speakers, the three speakers from these three amazing talks. I would like to invite um, Dr. Pablo Garcia Nieto, 
from the CZI single cell program and also from the CZ cell to gene discover. Um, Welcome, Paulo. Paulo uh, obtained his Bachelor's of Science in Genomics from the UNAM, Mexico in 2013. He then worked as a research assistant at the Stanford University, investigating the influence of genome architecture on carcinogen susceptibility. Afterwards, he pursued a PhD in cellular and molecular biology, also at the Stanford University and finishing in 2020, focusing on the creation and analysis of mutational maps in the human body. Currently, he works as a computational biologist at the, at the Shen Zuckerberg Initiative, contributing to the development of this Shen Zuckerberg tool, the cell to gene platform. Welcome, Paulo. Thank you very much for accepting to be here today with us. Thank you, Vinicius. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Thank you so much for that introduction. And uh, I'm very excited to be presented, uh, presenting here today at the HCA Latin America. As you said, my name is Paolo Garcia. I'm a computational biologist working at CCI. And today I want to talk to you about three main things. I want to give you a general overview of the CCI Science Initiative. Then I want to also give you a quick overview of what we do in the single cell team. And finally, I want to give you a demo of this very exciting tool that we have developed at CCI to analyze single cell data called cell by gene. Our mission at the Science Initiative is to support science and technology that will make it possible to cure, prevent, or manage all diseases by the end of this century. We understand that this is a very ambitious goal, but we put a lot of emphasis on the managing of all diseases and obviously, this is a goal that spans the next 80 years. And we, may, we want to make diseases uh, manageable at all uh, stages of life in a way that we can dramatically increase the quality of life when experiencing disease. Um, but we also have to have short-term goals. And within the next 10 years, our main goal is to advance research and develop technologies to observe, measure and analyze any biological process within the human body at the very small scale. We do this by three main things. We fund, we do, and we build. So we fund research by providing grants and making them uh, publicly available to everyone to apply. Uh, we do by working closely with scientists at our partner institutions to perform specific types of experiments or collaborations that cannot be normally do in any research institution. And finally, we build software technologies to help scientists analyze data that they generate through these research efforts. Our leadership, we are uh, led at the Science Initiative by Steve Quake. He's the head of science as of summer of this year. Previously, Corey Bergman was now fully devoting uh, her efforts to her own lab, used to be the head of science, and she's now uh, an advisor of the initiative. Phil Smoot is the VP of engineering, and Mark Malandro is the VP of operations. He makes everything happen, specifically when it relates to all the finances that relate to uh, all the grants that we provide. At the initiative within science, uh, these are the three main areas that we, that we work with. We work with the CC Biohub, which is a research institute based of San Francisco, uh, where they collaborate a lot with uh, Stanford researchers, Berkeley researchers, as well as uh, Santa Cruz researchers. And then we have all these different initiatives, uh, the imaging, neurodegeneration, open science, the single cell biology, which is where I work, and the science and society team. It's very hard as a nonprofit organization to measure success. And these are the three main ways that we try to achieve that. Uh, we want to focus on productivity of the research that we support uh, in the way of publications, preprints, software that's available, protocols, resources. Uh, we try to reach the scientific community by really trying to make the position of all the software or data that is generated in public repositories. Mm -hmm. And we try to foster uh, collaborations between all uh, our grantees 
and all the scientific community that is around us. And we do this by creating jamborees, meetings, or networking experiences. Uh, as of 2021, last year, as a, as a whole, the science initiative has awarded more than a thousand grants. So we're very happy that we recently broke that thousand uh, grant uh, mark. Uh, we have uh, created 58 meetings and convenience uh, where we put together our grantees or different researchers that we can tackle together issues or we can create networking opportunities. And we're very close to be funding a billion uh, dollars in grants. And so we're very excited that probably uh, this past year we have actually passed that mark. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about what we do specifically with the single cell team. Again, we're supporting science to measure biology, but in this case, what we want to measure is the molecular underpinnings that occur at the fundamental unit of life, which is a single cell. So we, we try to accelerate single cell biology by supporting methods, technologies, and applications. And this is a general overview of everything that we've done in the single cell team over the past five years. Uh, we started by creating a set of grants that supported the generation of single cell data. The very first of these grants was called the SIP networks. And the goal of the SIP networks was to generate data or to support research to generate data for the major organs of the human body using healthy references. But then after that, we identified that there were gaps uh, in our data that we were generating. And specifically, there are huge gaps in terms of the diversity of the donors that are providing their data in terms of their ancestry. So we created a, a grant to foster the generation of data about uh, across diverse um, ancestry donors. And I, I believe that there's a few of our grantees uh, in this call, and we're very happy to see their work as well. Another big gap that we have, it, it's when it comes to different um, life stages and specifically to early uh, stages in human life. We have very little data when it comes to pediatrics, to children, to human children, and we have generated also a grant that supports that area. And finally, because we want to get really close to uh, that disease aspect of, of research, uh, we released a grant that relates to inflammation, anything inflammation. And as you may know, inflammation is a pretty general topic. And that's why we were very intentional about aiming towards inflammation as the first step to understand disease, because we can actually cover a broad, uh, a broad spectrum of diseases. So these are our grants that relate uh, to dairy generation. And we recently, this year, put out a grant that relates to the interpretation of this data. Uh, so we had these data insights and network uh, RFA request uh, for access, where we are supporting research, specifically computational research, that reuses or uses data that has been previously generated, either to provide biological insights as to that data, to integrate different data sets, or to provide tools so that the community can use this data in a meaningful way. Currently, this is the only grant that's still open. So stay tuned. We just closed the second cycle of it. There's going to be a total of three cycles. So stay tuned. Uh, for the next few months where we're going to open the final cycle and then you can apply to it. And finally, uh, the single cell team, we have developed uh, this piece of software called Cell by Gene that helps everyone with very little coding experience to have access and to analyze single cell data. Um, over the past five years, uh, close to 900 grants have been given to researchers and that sums up to $190 million. Uh, and we're very happy that our grantees span across more than 50 countries around the globe. Uh, this is what I just talked about, the Data Insights Grant. Um, um, this, 
This data is a little bit updated. This was for the first cycle, uh, but as I said, just stay tuned uh, for the final cycle when it opens, and um, we'll be happy to reveal any of any of the applications that come from this uh, from this group as well. Okay, now I'm going to transition into cell hygiene, and I want to give you uh, a quick demo of all the features that exist uh, in in this piece of software. I want to first start by telling you that we have two different flavors of cell hygiene. We have cell hygiene discover, which is an online data portal uh, that comes with a suite of tools to help you discover, download, and analyze all these data sets that we have in this portal. And we have cell hygiene annotate, which is a cell hosting, meaning that you can install this software in your own laptop to analyze any data that you have. And you can think of it of a smaller version of cell by gene discover that you can install in your laptop. But the full functionality of cell by gene comes from this online version of it. And that's the part that I wanna focus on for the rest of the presentation. Um, I'm actually gonna share a link the portal right now on the chat so that you guys can follow uh, as I go with the presentation to everyone. So you can access the portal using that link and it's currently live and it's working well. Uh, so hopefully we won't have any issues for the rest of the of the presentation. Um, so cell by gene discover. It's an online ecosystem for standardized single cell gene expression. Um, and uh, we put a lot of emphasis on the standardized aspect of it. And what I mean by that is that all the data that we have hosted in the portal goes through a very strict process of standardization. That means that all the genes are annotated in the same way. Um, many of you know, those who work in computational biology, that one of the biggest challenges of working with public data is to make it all harmonized, to make it all talk to each other. Uh, because it all comes from different references, different genomes, different dictionaries. So we have put a lot of effort into standardizing the gene names as well as all the cell metadata that we have. So we have uh, metadata that concerns to a species, the technology that was used to generate it, tissue, cell type, age, and the sex, donor, ethnicity, and disease. And we're very excited to be using um, ontologies to this for this shared vocabulary. Uh, and there's a lot of power in using those ontologies, and I will showcase uh, a little bit more of that uh, in a few slides. And finally, the type of data that we post is process data, meaning that it's matrices uh, where each row is a cell and each column is a column. And we post both the row counts as, as they come out, out, of the, out of the sequencing machine as well as the normalized data as it was normalized by the renal contributors. Um, there are three main things that you can do here in the portal. You can browse all the data that we have so that you can find whatever is of most interest to you. You can download um, any of the data that we have and you can perform exploratory analysis with no coding experience. And I'm going to go through each of these areas and give you a few examples of the processes that you can, you can do within each of them. Uh, so first of all, browsing the data. When you go into uh, the homepage that I, that I sent you, you can also go and click here on collections. And I'll give you another link that directly goes to that collections page. And here uh, you can see all the data that we have in the portal, either through collections or data sets. A collection, it's a group of data sets that are meaningful, meaningfully related to each other. Usually they all come from the same publication or they all come from the same consortium. Uh, so just for the, for the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna focus, focus on collections. And we have created this set of filters that are analogous to a shopping cart so that you can very quickly go and try to find the data of interest to you. Uh, so here, I'm gonna have an animation of what it looks like to be using these filters. 
Uh, for example, you can look for specific authors if you're interested in, in a specific uh, publication uh, that you want to be looking at. Uh, you can also look for biological entities. And because we use an ontology, you can see that, for instance, in this case, our tissue filter, it's uh, pretty complex in which we can look for systems, organs, and the actual tissues that um, relate to the data set that we have hosted. Um, so this has made it very easy to find any data that you're interested in. Finally, once you click in a collection, you are presented with general information about that collection, a description that was provided by the contributors, uh, a publication in the case that there's a publication, and any other external links that relate to that collection. And then under that, you will have all the data sets that are associated to this collection. In this case, there's only one data set with some extra information about each of these data sets. When it comes to downloading data, um, we have provided very easy ways to download any data set that you want. So if you go here and click on the download button, uh, then you have access to uh, the two main methods used or the two main formats used in single cell right now, H5AD for Python users and uh, RS, RDS for R users. And you can either download using the browser or you can also copy that link into a terminal and download that way. We're working very hard to create an API for anyone who wants to have programmatic access to the data portal. And we are putting a lot of efforts into making this API cell-centric, meaning that you're not constrained to having to look at individual data sets, but you have access to the entire data that we have in the portal. Similar to the filtering experiences that we have with the user interface, we want to have that put in a programmatic way. Give me all the cells that are from the long, that are about this age uh, in specific Disease, and it will give you all those cells regardless of what data set they're coming from. So stay tuned for this API as we're planning to launch it potentially in the next quarter. Um, now I'm going to go into uh, some of the exploratory analysis uh, that you can do in the portal. Uh, first, I want to show you what we call the Cell Legend Explorer. So again, with this view, if you click in the Explore link over there, you'll be presented uh, with this two-dimensional representation of all the cells in that data set. Uh, and that two-dimensional representation relates to usually the UMA or PCA, but recently, since we have also spatial data, it can relate to spatial coordinates of the cells in that data set. And here I'm showcasing a way in which you can color by all the different metadata. For example, in this case, I color by cell types, and then I added the cell type labels uh, to all the cells, and that way we can kind of get a general assessment of how well these, uh, these cells are clustered. But we can also look for genes, for specific genes, and look at the expression of those genes across all of our cells uh, by clicking in that tiny droplet that's on the right hand side. And then you'll be able to see the gene expression of this gene across all the cells. Uh, within the Explorer, uh, one of the main use features of it is the differential gene expression tool. And this is some, something that actually takes quite some work to do it uh, as a computational biologist, but it's actually super simple to do it here in the user interface. So I can use this lasso tool to create a group of cells and then use the lasso tool again to create a different group of cells and very quickly perform differential gene expression. And here they are the results. You can explore the top results for the first group and then the top results for the second group to confirm that the differential gene expression work nicely. In most of the cases, it works really well when you're trying to identify microgenes. Uh, but we're also working on a different feature that will let you automatically identify microgenes for all the cell types of interest. And finally, I want to go into a an actual live demo of uh, this other feature that we recently launched that we're very excited about. Um, I'm going to give you another link, put it in the Zoom chat again. If you want to follow along, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> so this new feature, it's called Gene Expression. And it's a feature that has access 
to all the data that we have hosted. So we're very excited about it because it's the first feature that utilizes a way of integrating the data and giving you access to that integration of the data in a very easy uh, and meaningful way. Um, so the first thing that we need to do in this feature is to add a tissue. So I'm just going to start with long. And then once we have added a tissue, we can see all the cell types that we have for that tissue across all data sets that come from the lung. And then we can start adding genes. So let's just start with a simple gene that we all know, a subunit of the, the tubule. So when we add a tissue and a gene, what we do, we can see a dot plot of gene expression. And I'm just going to add a few or more other genes to show the functionality of it. Um, give me a second. You can also copy and paste any genes here, comma separated list of genes. And so while it loads, uh, what's gonna show, it's a full view of gene expression of all of these genes uh, across the cell types that we have. Here we go. And so here we have a little legend explaining what the size of each dot represents and what the color represents. So the color represents the average gene expression and the size represents the percentage of this cell type that are expressing a given gene. And so we can use a combination of those two metrics to get a general understanding of what's going on uh, with gene expression of all these genes across these cell types. Uh, if I click here on the info tab, you'll see all the data that was used to, to generate this blood. So as you can see, we have a lot of blood data in the portal. So this comes from 12 different collections, all this data. And um, well, uh, another thing that I wanted to show you about this is that if you hover over any dot, it'll give you extra information about that specific dot and the, the, the numbers that are associated to it as well. And uh, one thing that we recently launched is to be able to sort uh, these cell types or the genes in different ways. So currently the cell types are, are sorted using the ontology. And so that's why we have this very nice view and relate and lineage relationships between the different cell types as they're presented here. And the genes are ordered in the way that were introduced into the system. But we can uh, order these cell types and genes uh, also by using a hierarchical, um, a hierarchical algorithm so that we can uh, see better the groupings of these genes and cell types. So what are the cell types and genes that are closely related to each other based on their gene expression profiles? And then we can go ahead and explore all the data that we have here. Another very exciting thing is that since this is coming from all the data in the portal and we have standardized all of the data, uh, it's very easy to uh, filter the data. So if you're in interested in specific data set, we can just look at that specific data set and it'll filter it very quickly. Uh, if, you're specific, if you're interested in specific disease, ethnicity, or sex, you can also filter very quickly. And so I encourage everyone who's interested in understanding the gene expression of any gene of interest to just come play around uh, with this tool uh, we're very open to hearing feedback from the community because, as I said, we recently launched uh, this feature and we want to make it as, use as usable as possible for all of you guys. So we're always very open to hearing feedback and to implementing that feedback. Uh, one last thing that I didn't mention is that we can actually download uh, whatever we're seeing here in the dot plot, either as a PNG or as a SVG, so you can use it uh, for any sharing goals that you have in mind. Yeah, I'm going to come back to my presentation. I had some animations in case the live demo didn't work, so I'm just going to skip those. Uh, and I want to finish giving you a general, um, a general view of all the data that we have, because these features are only as useful as the data that we have. Uh, so we have close 
We have more than 27 million cells currently hosted. Most of it comes from human, 22 million, and 5 million of those come from mouse. We host more than 480 data sets. And even though we haven't really put, we haven't put a priority in hosting disease data, we first want to generate a healthy reference. Uh, we have already around 46 different diseases. And this spans more than 550 cell types. These are the top technologies that we have hosted. Handex, because it's easy and it's quick and it's cheap. Uh, that's the most data that has been generated so far. And that's also the, the highest technology that we currently have in the portal. And these are the top tissues with the number of cells that we have currently in the portal. And you can see that we have a very regular cadence of ingesting data. So it is the number of data sets that we ingest over time. And it's also the number of cells that we just have in time. So we're actively working on getting more and more data. And we have a specific team of curators that they're full time working on standardizing the data and putting it in the portal. So if you're interested in hosting your data, please reach out to me or reach out to cellbygene at cciscience.com. And we'll be very happy to work with you to host the data and to have access to all of these tools for your own data. Uh, these are some, some of the partnerships that we have uh, in terms of scientific uh, collaboration. So we, have, we are hosting data from all of these uh, different consortia and institutions for data curation. It doesn't actually happen within CCI. We have a group at Stanford that's, uh, as I said, full-time working on these curation efforts. And we're working really closely with all these uh, different uh, software packages to make integration between cell gene and these packages more easy to, to work. Uh, I just want to finish by thanking all of the team across the single cell uh, in the single cell science initiative. And uh, we have here on the left side all the product team, then in, in yellow, all of our engineers. Uh, and then in this sort of salmon color, computational biologists, data scientists, and then the wonderful people who made the grants happen are on the way here on the right side. And with that, I just want to thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. I believe there's still some time for that. Um, thank you very much, Pablo, for this wonderful talk. We have a couple of questions here, but before I'd like to mention that it's really amazing uh, to have CCI funding initiatives in single cell. We know at least um, four, about four projects funded by CCI across Latin America, including the, the, the Inflammation and the Ancestry Network grant grants. And three of them were represented here in this event giving talks. It's really, it is really helping to build capacity and infrastructure across the region in order to also to have us as part of the Human Cell Atlas, contributing with data and also decreasing the gap and the underrepresentation of the region in, in the public genomic studies. Now I have a, let's move to some questions. Uh, the first one is by myself, actually. Do you have a feature in Cell by Gene to analyze or explore spatial transcriptomics data? Yeah, we do. And uh, we're working on implementing better ways in which we can analyze it. We're already hosting it. And um, we host data from uh, Visium 10x, uh, SlideSick, uh, Merfish, and I'm blanking on the other technology that we have. But we already have plenty of spatial data, so you can download it very quickly and very easily. It's the part of analyzing it with no coding that we're trying to uh, come up with good ideas and good features as to how you guys can analyze the data. But, the spatial data is already there, uh, available for download if anyone's interested on that. Okay, great. We have now a, a, a question by Gamal Akabani. Pablo, are you supporting any spatial biology research proposals? Um, can they clarify the question as in, uh, in terms of the grants that we provide or for- Yeah, I believe it's about the grants, right? Mm -hmm. So all of the grants that were supporting data regeneration, they had um, they had the possibility to do that through spatial transcriptomics. We never uh, we never were exclusive about the kind of data that was generated. Obviously, gene expression is the main one that we 
heard the most about, but we uh, supported a lot of um, epigenomic symbol cell, uh, spatial, and with the ancestry uh, grant, we also were supporting genetic data. Um, so to answer the questions, we don't have plans to specifically support spatial transcriptomics, but all of our grants do not exclude that possibility. So in the future, if there's other grants, feel free to apply and make it spatial specific, and that's not going to hurt you in any way. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Uh, do you uh, How does cell by gene data sets relate or is connected to the human cell atlas data coordination platform? Right. Uh, so that group at Stanford, or full-time curation group, is working really closely with the with the DCP to try to ingest all the data that the DCP has, and even the data that the DCP doesn't have because they're not fully up to date with all the data that has been generated with the human cell atlas. Uh, we also collaborate with those groups who haven't submitted to the DCP to try to bring their data in, but that's. Uh, our top priority from the curation team. So we're working really closely with them to have all the HCA data available here. Amazing. And another question here from Adolfo Rojas. Do you have a training program in which one could apply in order to organize short course, short course using cell by gene platform? We currently don't have that. And I'm very happy to hear that because it's a request that we have heard constantly. We're ideating as to what is the best way that we can reach the community and try to try to teach how to use these tools. Uh, one of the ideas that we've had is to create uh, office hours, a weekly office hours hour where everyone could just join and ask questions about it. But trainings and workshops uh, is something that we have been working on. Um, so stay tuned. Um, I, I I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, but any anywhere we go to present, uh, we try to give this type of demos where we give a general introduction. What we understand that it'd be better to have a full hour devoted just to learning everything about cell by gene. But what we do, uh, we fulfill individual requests. So if anybody's labs in, is interested in learning more about it, they can just reach out to me uh, in the email that you see here, and we can try to set up an hour where I can uh, sit down and try to uh, teach uh, everything that relates to cell hygiene within one hour. That has happened in the past already. This is great to hear. And now another question by Gamal Akabani. Pablo, the immune system is inherently present in every organ and tissue. Are immune cells included in the cell grouping by organ or tissue? That's a great question. Uh, it really depends. We don't have control on the nature of the data. It really depends on the data that's given to us. Uh, but I would say that um, immune cells currently are highly present in the majority of the tissues, obviously not as much as in blood, but lung is a great example of that. Uh, the brain, not so much because we don't really have a lot of immune cells there, but um, that we can really measure quickly. Um, the spleen is a good example of that. Uh, the heart, we have a lot of immune cells there. But so yeah, we, we have uh, immune cells across tissues, not as much as, as blood, but again, that's independent of our efforts, more like whatever it comes with the data. Thank you. Um, Gamal is also asking for your email. I believe you can chat him after the talk for future discussions. Um, yeah, of course. I, I have another question here by Ricardo Verdugo. Thank you, Pablo, for the presentation. In Cell by Gene, I did not quite understand the meaning of the expressed in cells percentage. What is the numerator and the, and the, 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 the numerator and the denominator? Right. Um, so this relates to the sparsity of single cell data. Um, when we sequence a cell, we're not guaranteed that we're going to sequence all genes. We actually sequence an average of about 2,000 genes for any given cell. So that numbers means, so in this case, if you see they're expressed in cells, so we have a total of 17 mesothelial cells in the portal, but this gene was only detected in 11 out of those 17 this specific gene. And so the numerator is 11 and the denominator is 17. So that's why that's how we calculate the number. Uh, I hope that makes sense. If not, I can clarify more. 
And now another question by Teresa. She apologized if, her, if she missed this, but do you have do you have to do the cell type identification of each cluster manually, or would cell by gene do that for you? I work with human skin, I, and I didn't see this tissue included in your database. Let's see. Do we have skin? I think we only have skin. Yeah, we do have skin. There's very few data sets that we have of this of the skin, uh, but we do have skin um, now. All the cell types um, are annotated by the original contributors, and it's currently not working. Um, all the cell, the cell types are annotated by the original contributors, but the cell by gene um, annotate, the version that you can install in your laptop, we recently launched an automated detection of cell types, but we're working very slowly on that because we are creating models for each of the tissues that we have so that you can use uh, those models on your own data to annotate cell types. So currently we only have a model for the blood, but in the future we'll have models for all their tissues. So stay tuned for that as well. And here's the skin that you have right Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pablo. And just to mention that in, the, in our workshop last year, uh, we, we we presented some of the features of the cell by gene in the workshop for uh, that we organized devoted to RNA seq data analysis focusing on Latin America. Pablo, thank you very much for the great talk. It was amazing. And thank you very much, all the audience, for this session of this morning. It was really great to have all the five amazing talks. And now I invite you to have a cough break or a lunch uh, according to each time zone. And we'll be back at 13 EDT time for our afternoon section. Thank you very much, everybody. See you soon. <laughs>